Shalom, I'm Batya. And I'm Muttal. And this, this is, is Stuff, stuff you, should you Should Know. It's all of that stuff that you always wanted to know, you wondered about, you learned about one day, long time ago. This was Stuff You Knew. But now, for some reason, you're listening to a podcast called Stuff You Should Know. <laughs> you're probably Jewish. You may not be Jewish. There's a, we get a lot of mail from non-Jewish people. We get a lot of mail from people... Who just found out they were Jewish. Right. right? That's, that's, yeah, that's welcome. Cool. That's really welcome. exciting. Glad to have, welcome home. Yeah. I think that talking about the Temple Mount is something that people might be learning about for the first time. Well, I think everybody's heard about the Temple Mount and they know it is somehow important to Jews. They know it's important to Muslims. It's for sure. In the no- it's in the news Frequently, a bit, a, a frequently, especially this week, and we don't usually do politics no. on 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 this show, so we got to cover this in a way that's not going to be political. But there's kind of like like a perfect storm in that it's it's been in the news, and it is such a central part to being Jewish, and and it's in the parsha this week. It's in this week's Torah portion. Right. It's mentioned for the first time. We have this story in Parsha Vayera. And to me this is one of the most problematic stories, the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, which we could do an entire stuff you should know episode on. Like, right. Like definitely. what is that about? Right. You know, <laughs> like human sacrifice Whoa, if there's anything really that's an anathema story. to 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 Judaism, it is that. Right. But in this, and many of you know that story, right? And we're not going to get into why, and we're not going to get the reasons behind it, but God appears to Abraham in this story, and he says, please take Isaac and go to the land of Moriah and bring him up there as an offering upon one of the mountains that I shall tell you so abraham he wakes up early in the morning he saddles up the old donkey he takes his two young men with him and isaac his son and he takes a little bit of wood and he heads to the place of which god had spoken to him and here's where we get to our 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 thing this week on the third day abraham raised his eyes and he perceived the place from afar And Abraham said to his young men, stay here by yourselves with the donkey, and I and the lad, Isaac, Yitzchak, will go yonder, we'll worship, and we'll return. And the two of them went off together to this place. So what was this place? This place, Mount Moriah. And if you're looking for it to read along, it's in Genesis, which is Bereshit. Chapter 22. Basically all of chapter 22 is this story. And uh, according to tradition, this place is what is today the Temple Mount, Mount Moriah. And there's all sorts of geographical tools that will point to this being true. For instance, they are coming from Beersheba. We know where Beersheba is. Correct. You know, all of Jewish history basically here goes in a line. You have this line of cities that runs up the spine of Israel in the hill country. You have Beersheba, Hebron, Jerusalem, Beit El, and Shechem, which is present-day Nablus. We know where all those cities are, and it makes sense. It's about a three-day walk. Not that I've ever done it. You know, take a bus, but it's a a car. It's a three-day. It makes sense. Right. It's about a three-day walk from Beersheba up to, and we know, you know what's cool? We know where the road is. It's so amazing that when we came here and you've heard these biblical stories and these biblical cities and to find that they exist, and a lot of them you can go there, you can walk those streets. You see the ruins. You go to the ruins of Beersheba. Tell Beersheba is amazing, and you see you see the, the civilization from the time that Abraham would have been there. You're really learning right. Torah with your feet here. It's amazing. Okay, so you're talking about the different cities I mean, at we, the spine right. of Right, and not Israel. far from where we're sitting right here in Gush Etzion, they have a place called the Derek, Derek Avot, the path mm-hmm. of our forefathers, which is the road they would have taken. This is definitely the route that they would have taken, and there is a place where you can just, you could stand there, 
And it's the place you could just see in the way distance the Temple Mount. It's beautiful, breathtaking, panoramic view. Right. From this from this right. old dirt it road. It looks like the Bible. Yes. It looks like the Bible. And um, and there's still Roman mile markers on it, and you could find ancient McVote. You could find all sorts of things. Come here. We'll show you around a little bit. <laughs> so anyway, he goes up there, and this is really the first mention in the Torah of this place. that. And we'll talk about, like, what is what is it about that? What did he perceive? What did he see? I just want to cover a little of the history first. Okay. Let's go there. Give everybody a context. So... Let's go through, now we're going to quickly go through 3,500 years of Jewish history in the next <laughs> in 60 nutshell, seconds. In, in the next nutshell. 60 seconds. Right. But you know, guys know the story, you know, doesn't really sacrifice Isaac. Sure. Then, um, then you know, the, Isaac has Jacob and Jacob has 12 sons and they go down to Egypt and they come back and they wander in the desert for 40 years and they come back into the land of Israel and... 3,000 years ago, in the year 1,000, just about, give or take, before the Common Era, 1,000 before the Common Era, King David comes up to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, we know, Jerusalem is an ancient city. Jerusalem is mentioned in extra-biblical texts dating back over 3,000 years. It's a real place. David comes. He conquers it. And... What draws him to it, partially, is this connection to this mountain. The city of David that you could go to today, the city that he conquered from the Jebusites, is on this hill that's adjacent and the lower part of what is today the Temple Mount. When he arrives in 1000 BCE, about, what's up there at that point? What's on that mountain? Ah, so... The one thing that we know, what's on top of the, well, on the lower part is a Jebusite city. Right. But on the upper part, on Mount Moriah, the only thing that we know is up there is a threshing floor of a Jebusite guy named Aravna. We know his name even. We know, we know his name. I mean, it's not like we found a gym bag that said Aravna, <laughs> but it's in, uh, I'm reading here in the second book of Samuel, chapter 24, um, where the prophet God, not G-O-D, but Gad, I guess, would be in, uh, in, in English, um, comes to David and says, Go up and erect an altar to the Lord in the threshing floor of Aravna, the Jebusite. And David went up according to the word of the Lord, as the Lord had commanded, and Aravna looked at afar and he sees the king and his servants passing towards him and Aravna went out and he bowed down to the king on the ground and Aravna said why have you come here and he says David says I want to buy your threshing floor <laughs> and uh, I imagine they go back and forth a little bit and he, and he says and Aravna says to David let my lord ta- lord the king take and offer up what seems good in his eyes and uh, eventually they go back and forth, and David buys it. Okay. Now, what's interesting is there are only three places that the Tanakh says were actually purchased by Jews. I was just thinking money. about that. Avraham, he bought Machpelah. Machpelah and Hebron. We know Shechem, Nablus, was purchased for to place um, Joseph's tomb there, to bury Joseph. And the Temple Mount. And these today are the three most hotly contested sites in all of Israel. The three that we clearly purchased. Right. Well, it's, I don't know. It's not clearly. Can you use the Bible as, right. a, as a, it's not like, you know. It's not your purchase order. Right. It's exactly. <laughs> it's not a receipt from Rami Levy. It's a, <laughs> right. uh, it, it's, you know, but we, we believe, we believe that uh, we definitely have a connection and we're there. Now, King David doesn't build the temple there. He's told by the prophet Natanel that the house of God cannot be built by a warrior who has blood on his hands. Not that all of King David's battles weren't righteous. They were. We're not a pacifistic nation. There are times where we have to go to war. So you're saying the the first time he's spoken to by God, and now he's being spoken to by a different by a different prophet. This is the age of the prophets, mm-hmm. 
and um, says, you know what? It's going to be built by your son, Solomon. And sure enough, King Solomon in 950 before the Common Era, early 2000s after the Common Era, so 3,000 years ago, a little bit less than 3,000 years ago, builds this temple on Mount Moriah. And Mount Moriah becomes Har Habayit, the mountain of the house, and so this is a place where there was the threshing floor and it was place, sitting there in that owned place. by the king and his son Solomon. It's now state property builds comes along and he builds the first temple. The first temple circa 950 before the common era. Okay. And um that temple that temple stands for like 400 years until the Babylonians come. Hmm. Babylonians come and conquer this land in the year 586, 586 years before the Common Era. They destroy the temple, level it to the ground, expel a bunch of Jews out of, um, out, out, out of Israel. And uh, for about 70 years, the Jews aren't allowed to come back until about the year 450. Okay, what happens in 450? The Babylonian Empire falls to the Persian Empire, and King Cyrus makes a declaration that all people could return to the lands from which they came from. And King practice Cyrus is now the king uh, in Israel. Of the Persian. No, he's a Persian king that controls Israel. He controls, controls Israel. the entire Babylonian Empire. He controls, like, he's got the whole thing. He's 128 provinces from Persians control this is wow yeah from this is the Purim story later comes later on like his grandson or great grandson but from they're Hodu the world superpower right? right wow um and Ezra and Nehemiah come back and they build this rickety old temple on hmm. the temple mount which is the start of the era of this what's called the second temple era and they have king's permission at this point go ahead and build build it it's like all all you Jews you could go back and guess what happens Jews are like, hey, we're kind of comfortable here in, <laughs> in Babylon, in Persia. Like, we've got kosher sushi in the supermarkets. We're set up. We've got houses. We've got houses. We've got day schools. Only 40,000 of them come back. But they build this temple. And that t- second temple stands. And this 40,000 comes, and they're living near this temple area. In Judea, the town is called. And we've found tons of archaeological evidence from the Persians that this area was called Judea, and it was the province of Judea, and there's all sorts so of So they're coins. really living and out here. They're living around here. They're living in Jerusalem. They're living in the environs around Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then still, this is, you know, 2,500 years ago. This is a, it's a long time to wrap your head around. Right. And this continues on, um, and the temple stands, and it gets built up a little nicer and a little nicer. Until the year 40 before the Common Era, 40 years before the Common Era, King Herod comes to power. Mm. And by this time, the land of Israel, Judea, is a Roman client state. Herod is a Roman client king. Herod is a, he's a problematic figure. Mm. He's always like a little too Jewish for the Romans, a little too Roman for the Jews. But the one thing he is absolutely good at, I mean, two things. One is politics. He's mm-hmm. fantastic at politics. He could give anyone, he could give anyone in Israeli politics today a run for their money. <laughs> he, um, he's a builder, and he decides he's going to take the Temple Mount, and he's going to turn it into one of the wonders of the world. Wow. And he starts. He has a few wonders. He's got a few wonders. He here. built Caesarea. He built uh, Masada, Machpelah, Masada, the Herodian, which is which is right, we, which we could see it's from view out of Tekoa. our front yard. That's we right? live basically right next to the Herodian. Um, he's a master builder, but the crown jewel in his kingdom of building mm-hmm. is he takes this mountain and he decides to expand it. So, how do you expand? and create a plaza around a mountain, he creates these giant retaining walls. And then in with inside the retaining walls, he builds these arches and fills the arches with dirt until he has the largest man-made platform 
in the entire world at the time. This is around zero. Was the it the, the largest man-made structure in the whole world? Not the just whole a structure platform. was the largest man-made structure. There was nothing bigger in the entire world than Herod's temple in Jerusalem. And he it had arches on top of arches on top of arches in some places. Yes. Amazing. 36 acres, 25 football fields. Mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. And it was completed, and all of this work it employed something like 180,000 people. It was the largest construction site. It's completed, and it stands for five years <laughs> until, <laughs> until the Romans come and destroy it. They destroy. Now, they didn't destroy the platform. They destroy everything on top of the platform. And at that point, what's on top of the platform? Well, the it's second rubble. temple is there, right? Right. The second temple was there. Um, they, imagine taking a shoebox mm -hmm. and sticking it over a hill. Right. Right? So that it squares off the hill. Correct. So, and then build little Lego things on top of the <laughs> shoebox. That right. was it. And then take the Lego things apart and strew the Lego things all over. <laughs> that's what happens. That's basically what happens. If, if you want a... If you want to explain that to right, your right, if, uh, four-year-old. Right. If you want uh, some sort of guiding aid to, right. to understand this, that's what you would do. Mm -hmm. Now, that stands, that stands completely empty. The year 135, King Hadrian comes... And he announces... This is a real history lesson. This is a this real episode. history lesson. We're going to get to some spiritual stuff, but you should know this. I mean, it's a Temple Mount. It's our holiest place. I'll go a little faster. King Herod comes... I mean, uh, King Hadrian comes in 135 and renames Jerusalem into... Changes it into, as punishment for the Jews, who have just revolted again, he changes it into Aelia Capitolina. It's no longer Jerusalem. It's now Aelia Capitolina, mm -hmm. and it is a pagan city to the god Jupiter. So we're talking Romans here. We're talking Romans. We're talking 135 of the Common Era. And he creates this temple, not on the Temple Mount, but in Jerusalem, right off of the main street, the main street, the Cardo. You can still see this today. Mm -hmm. He creates a temple to the god Jupiter. Now, 325, mm -hmm. the Emperor Constantine converts to Christianity. Mm -hmm. Basically, all the fun goes out of being a Roman at that point. Like, gone <laughs> are the vomitoriums and all the Roman decadence and hello Gregorian chants, <laughs> right? It's, um, he makes, he Romanizes this sect of Judaism, basically, and makes it a Roman pagan you know the early christian church the byzantine church and he moves the capital of the roman empire he moves it from rome to constantinople and it becomes the byzantine empire and he takes this temperate temple of jupiter that's not on the temple mount but on next to the cardo and turns it into a church that church today is the church of the holy sepulcher so if you were here in Israel and you wanted to see that, you would be going to the old city of Jerusalem? Right. Well, it wasn't an old city then. <laughs> it, well, you'd be going to the time. city of Jerusalem. right? But you could see this. You could go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. You can go to, and it's not the same one. It was destroyed by the Muslims and then rebuilt by the Crusaders and then destroyed by the Muslims and then rebuilt by the Crusaders. And um, But there are parts of it that you could see that they could point out that like that's part of the original the Byzantine. The original structure. And there are tons of Byzantine ruins in uh, like just around us, near us. In the canyon right next to our house. Yeah. we Five minute walk ten, where we go yeah, hiking. I would that say are, 10, but I'm walking with walking kids slower. usually. <laughs> I'm walking the dog that you hear around here, our dog Maggie. She makes it onto the podcast every now and then. Yeah. We walk down there and you see these ruins of this Byzantine monastery and you see all of these like little pieces of mosaic floor. Right. From this era, it's like crazy, that, just strewn all over, all over the and ground. And there's still structures on and the hillside. Structures and pottery shards. Yeah. It's, we live in an old place. Anyway, 638 of the Common Era. Let's jump forward. The Muslims conquer the world. 638, they come to... Where are they coming from? They're coming from Arabia. 
They're coming from Arabia. Um, At this point, the the Muslims had all been in Arabia, and now they're branching out and conquering the world and heading to Jerusalem. Yes. Okay. Yeah. They they come. Um, Caliph Omar conquers it. And he want, he has got one question when he gets here. They're like, hey, look at our church of the Holy Sepulchre. He says, I want to know where the Temple Mount is. Uh, he finds a Jew. Okay. This is the way the story goes. He finds a Jew who's like, I'll show you where it is. I still know where it is. And he takes him up onto the Temple Mount. And they decide what they're going to build there. They see where that threshing floor was. And there's this exposed layer of bedrock where the threshing floor was where the Holy of Holies stood on top of this, and where, according to Jewish legend, and I don't even know what this really means, it's where the world was created from. Okay. And he decides he wants to protect that, and he's going to build a monument to that rock. Uh-huh. Like over cap that rock. it. Like cap it. And he does that. And what's interesting is the Dome of the Rock... Mm-hmm is an exact replica, an octagonal temple-type thing. It's an exact replica of the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Wow, that, what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very few people know that. If you go, if you look at their floor plans, especially the original floor plan that we figured out of the Church of the Holy Sepulcher from the ruins that are there in the archaeology that was done there, you see that one is the flip side of the other. What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it means that people had a way of building holy places. Might give us an insight into what the temple looked like at the time. Mm. I don't know. But it's interesting. But it's interesting. Very shortly after there, they built a mosque. Now, what's interesting is, you the know how many times... The Dome of the Rock is the... It's not a mosque. No. It's that big golden temple That's you see. That's the big golden dome. A big golden dome, exactly. The iconic picture that you see in Jerusalem, the big golden dome... That is, that is the which, Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount, which where I the think, first and second temple you see. Yeah, go ahead. I think most people think that that is the mosque where that's the, not the mosque, right? Right. The mosque is the Al Aqsa Mosque, which is next to that, which is on the Temple Mount on the southern end of the Temple Mount. And what's interesting is Jerusalem is never once mentioned in the Quran, never once mentioned. Years later. And this isn't written about, there's no written record of this until years and years and years later. Okay. It says in the Quran that on the last night of Muhammad's life, he and the angel Gabriel go on this night journey to the furthest mosque. Okay, the furthest mosque. Right, doesn't say in Jerusalem, doesn't say... But later on, when they wanted to have a claim to Jerusalem... He said, well, where would that furthest mosque been? That must have been the Holy Temple. Okay. So that becomes their tradition. That becomes their tradition. And the mosque that's there today, Al-Aqsa, literally means the furthest mosque. Mm, Really? Yes. So they have that as, and and, and they're there from 638, 1100, the Crusaders come, basically destroy everything and build churches. A few years later, um, Salah Din comes back. You can see a great one of my favorite movies, Kingdom of Heaven. Yeah. Right? Salah oh. Din, yeah, takes over, conquers Jerusalem. And the Muslims stand there. Eventually, it becomes the Ottoman Empire. And the Muslims are there until 1948. The Jewish people start coming home. And in 1967... Right, the old city is totally cut off. It's under Muslim control. Jews are not allowed to go there. 1967, after 2,000 years of dreaming, the Jewish people come home to the old city, and the call goes out for the first time in thousands of years since the Romans took it and destroyed it from us. Harabayat biadenu, the Temple Mount, is in our hands. And how long was it actually in our hands? So here's where we get into the current modern difficult politics of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It's still technically in our hands, meaning Jerusalem is an undivided city. We have annexed Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the capital of of the Jewish state. 
But a decision was made in 1967 when we're at war with all these people. Let's not worry about religious real estate here right now. And okay. whether you think it was a good decision or not a good decision, it worked. These are the facts. These are the facts. So immediately Moshe Dayan handed over the keys to the Temple Mount to the Islamic Wafq, the Islamic religious controlling body, and said, you have religious control on the Temple Mount right now. We're going to honor what's called the status quo. And this group is Jordanian, is... Controlled their main offices in Jordan, and they control... But, like, the problem that we've gotten into today is that it is against the law, and a lot of Jews and a lot of Israelis are seeing this as not where we want to be as progressive democratic nation, but it is forbidden for anyone who is a non-Muslim to pray on the Temple Mount. Mm. So for me as a Jew and for you as a Jew, we cannot go to our holiest place in the world if we go up there, we are accompanied by members of the WAF that they have to come and escort us. And they're accompanied by Israeli security. And if you move your lips in prayer, you'll be arrested. By whom? By Israeli troops. And they will take you where? They will take you off the Temple Mount. They'll write you a ticket. If you do it a couple times, you might serve 30 days in jail. Um, if you do it a lot, we know somebody who was actually shot this past week. It's a rough, it's a, it, it's a rough thing. And one of the reasons I wanted to bring he this up. He wasn't, out, he wasn't shot being up there. He was praying. shot because he was, because he, he was blip, targeted. Was shot. He was targeted because he is an activist to allow all religions to pray up there. He wants Christians, Christians Jews, Jews, and Muslims. and Muslims to be able to pray in a holy place. I think it's a very reasonable desire. And we're at a place and a time where religions tend to be not reasonable. And what's interesting, and we'll tie it all together with this, in the Bible, in the book of Amos, Amos, who's one of our co-boys, right. says, my house will be a house of prayer for all the nations of the world. Yeah. And I think, like, what is, so, like, for, I just went through thousands of years of history, and it seems all the world's attention is always focused on this little piece of real estate. Mm. And here's the way I think about it. I've been to places, we've been to places. You know, we've been in, in Asia, we've been to, I've been to Costa Rica, these places that are, like, spiritual vortexes. Sure. There are places that you go... You don't meet a lot of spiritual seekers in Hackensack, New Jersey. Not that there's <laughs> anything like terrible about it or, you know, there's Walnut Creek, few. California, where you're from. You know, there's a few. But then you have these places that it's like Sedona, Arizona, which are, are these spiritual vortexes for people who are seeking an encounter with something greater than their physical world. The Temple Mount is like the spiritual vortex of all of those spiritual vortexes. The whole world has always been pointed at and aiming to this one place. And I can't explain it. I don't say I, I don't claim to understand it. But one thing from looking at these notes here in front of us, that's just true. Right. It's true. There's been a, a battle for this holy place. And it's not, I mean, there have been battles, but there's been an obsession. Obsession, that's there's a good There's been way a to magnetic it. pull mm -hmm. to it. And I don't know what's going to be with the world. I'm by nature an optimist. But I know whatever's going to happen, this is going to be central. The Temple Mount is going to be central to both where the world is coming. We know it's central to where the world's coming from, and we know it's where the world's headed. And uh, we figured it would be, you know, definitely some stuff that you, as Jews, should know. Matzel, this was kind of a heavy, serious topic. It's Not a, a lot of laughing topic. in this one. Not a lot of laughing in this. We'll get back to the laughing. But it's, yeah, it's serious. And it's a serious time with it. Um, I hope you folks all learned something about the Temple Mount. And the best thing is come here. Come here and check it out. Come to the land of Israel is real here it's real <laughs> and uh right and and come learn the the torah with your feet 
walk around Eretz Yisrael. Learn it with us. We had some friends with buy us dinner some last week. You that, know. That, yeah, that was that was great. And read the Torah portion this week, Parshat right. Vayera, the twenty second chapter of the book of Genesis, and check out all of our other good stuff Jews should know stuff. Stuff you should let's just say it like that. Stuff you should know dot com. Find us on Facebook. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Muttel, Batia. Stuff you should know. Google it. There's no lack of information. But we have a YouTube channel now. We have a YouTube channel. We're going to be uploading our first YouTube video. So you and, can find uh, us at uh, Batia and Matel. Stuff you should know is up there now. Right. So we're there. Bottle, ma, bottle, ma, bottle. That would be our. Bottle. <laughs> that would be our, our celebrity, celebrity name. name. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Batia. Have a great week. Thanks for listening. Shalom, shalom.